Thank you so much. This is amazing for me. I've never been to India before, so I'm, I'm super excited to be here in Delhi. So, wait. Okay, um, so I've been introduced, but just to give you a little bit more background, I basically live and breathe MarTech. So I, I run the UK's largest MarTech festival. We do a lot of consultancy, a lot of learning, so I work with a lot of CMOs, CEOs, and chief marketing technologists to develop their marketing technology. But most importantly, today I'm here to talk about making marketing technology simple. But the truer thing I'm trying to do is make it simpler. There isn't simple, it's not easy to make it simple, but I do think there is some important foundations that need to be laid that don't currently exist. Now we all know MarTech's massive, we know it's booming, we're all here for that reason, and there's signs of it everywhere. I mean, it's amazing just to see how exponential the growth has been in marketing technology. You know, we can see this in agencies. Ogilvy has taken on 900 people to drive MarTech. You know, IPG making a 2.3 billion acquisition. We've got 30% of people's marketing uh, budgets is being spent on MarTech. And this year, 62% are set to drastically increase that. It's a massive space, and it's a super, super exciting time to be working in this. However, naturally with this comes a lot of complexity. Now, it's interesting what Atta was just saying about a move to D to C, and we've got a fantastic example of this with Nike. Everybody is moving towards MarTech. Everybody's investing heavily. Most recently, this is a fantastic um, quote here from the COO of Nike after their acquisition of an AI company. They're looking to beef up their knowledge, their, their skills, their expertise, their IP, in the ability to better understand the customer, to hyper-personalize. So there's this massive opportunity with marketing technology now. And it's really exciting to be here and be part of it. However, there is a problem. And this is a fantastic slide, MarTech's Law, from Mr. Scott Brinker, the godfather of MarTech. And this slide's a little bit old now, it's about two or three years old. But it couldn't be truer today. Organizational change can't carry on at the same rate of technology. So we have this gaping hole in the middle, which creates a lot of confusion, a lot of complexity, and a lot of a challenge. And with this, we still find that there's a hell of a lot of chat about MarTech or marketing technology. In fact, nearly 700,000 times the terms used in a, in a year. However, in my opinion, it's used incorrectly. You hear that, you think of this. You think again of Scott Brinker's landscape, you think 7,000 logos, you think technology. And this is wrong and it's not helpful. It creates so much confusion. You just start looking at vendors, solutions, and you're tackling this the wrong way around. So we need to start again. We kind of know what MarTech is, but we kind of don't. Yes, it's the inception of marketing technology, but what does that mean? It means a lot more than technology. It means a lot more than platforms. This inception of marketing technology has an impact in different ways, in four areas. So this is the framework I developed called the four P's of marketing technology. And it goes from planning and strategy, people and teams, platforms, apps, and ecosystems, process and operations. Or put in a more simplistic way, it's the why. It's the who, it's the what, and it's the how. And all too often, people jump straight into that what, straight into the 7,000 logos, straight into technology and solutions. It's not the answer. If you just tackle one quadrant, one quarter of this, it's where things go wrong. So I'm going to walk you through this framework in detail and give you a practical takeaway of how you can apply this yourself. So a lot of what I talk about might feel familiar, but it's bringing it all together, so you ask yourself those questions. Am I really thinking about these four Ps? So let's go back to the landscape, because I'm not suggesting it's not useful. The part that's useful is this, is the organization and the aggregation of the solutions. It's thinking about these topic areas. It's breaking these down. Throw away the logos. Stop thinking about X solution. Think about what problem it's solving. So here's what we're going to go through. We're going to throw these together. We're going to put our four P's of marketing technology 
together with the core classifications from the landscape. And we're going to use this framework to score out where we're headed and identify the areas for our roadmap we need to focus and develop. And from this, equally, we might understand areas we're already booming in and we're doing a fantastic job. So I'm going to walk you through all four areas, bit by bit. First up is planning and strategy. It's obvious, you need a plan. However, I find increasingly people do not have a clearly defined and documented marketing technology strategy. Or if they do, it is a list of vendors and solutions. It's not a MarTech strategy. Having the four Ps in your strategy will give you an integrated MarTech strategy. And what we need to do is we need to start with the business goals. We need to understand what problems are we trying to solve? What are we doing in the customer journey? And then as we develop our marketing strategy, we need to hone in and we need to carve out an area which is dedicated purely to MarTech and how it integrates with everything we do. Which takes us back to this framework. So we take those core classifications of the landscape and we take our four Ps and we systematically work through every single area. What we're trying to do is identify what do we currently have, audit what's in place, understand the people we have that are dedicated to data or the planning and strategy we have in place for our social. Work for all of these. You could do a series of workshops. You can do interviews. You can look at platform adoption across your teams. There's a whole multitude of different ways to do this and aggregate all this information internally to then ask yourself honest questions of where you sit in your maturity. And you score that and you understand and go, right, I know where I am today. I'm very clear where I am today. And then you can visualize it. And you can ask yourself questions of, What's wrong? So in, in one of these examples we've got, it may be that you've got fantastic people but you don't have the platforms. Or you've got great platforms but no people. Or you have no process or you don't have a plan. It's mixing and matching these together so you really map out where you have gaps and where you need to focus your time and effort. Now I can't go into too much detail on the small time I have, but in short, this proved unbelievably valuable for people to step back from the granularity and just say, what are we doing well, what are we not, where do we need to focus our time and effort? So just to sum up, fail to plan, plan to fail. You need to think about your objectives. You need to be very clear about what you're doing with your marketing technology strategy that fits around the customer journey. You need to audit where you are. Don't just jump in. Understand what exists right now before you move forwards and roll that out in a roadmap. Spot those areas where there's masses of opportunity. More likely than not, you might have amazing technology that isn't that it's failing, it's that you're failing by not having considered the other parts. Right, jumping into people and teams. This, I always find, is the part that's forgotten. People are very quick to throw money at technology, but when it comes to people, suddenly people go missing. So we find, and this stat backs it up massively, that. People don't, don't invest, and partly they don't invest because they think, buy the tech and it will solve the problem. The other thing they do is they suddenly think it will be easy, I'll be able to find these people. There's a massive shortage of fantastic talent, which makes it particularly complex, and there's a gap also in terms of learning and development, and part of that is the space is moving so fast. We saw the Martex law earlier, it's, it's moving at such a pace that to be very good at this, you need to be a real learner. So we have this, this shortage of skills. We have this lack of understanding of just how important people and teams are. So I'm going to walk you through a few ways that you can help improve on this. So this is from Gartner, and this is a, a nice, nice approach which we've mixed and matched with a few ideas. Now Gartner lays out um, what it says is developing in the market right now is a fat T. And a fat T is essentially taking individuals that have lots of depth and lots of breadth. Ultimately, they're these people that are fantastic at loads of things. You then have specialist roles, you have emerging roles, you have traditional T's. Gartner suggests that we're all moving towards fat T's. I think they're unicorns. I would love it if that was the case. Um, these are the people you would love to have in your team or are super important, but equally, it's very tough to find them. But if you take that thinking of, of these different shapes and different types of people, different types of skills, you can Tetris your team. So we recommend mapping out your team, the skills they have, and mixing and matching them together. So bringing together fat T's, emerging, 
specialists, and then we've added one to the mix, which is consultancies and agencies. Now, what I'm advocating here is that you don't look at finding a person with the core skills, but you think collectively, you think about your team, you think about the skill sets and mix and match those together to understand what you really need. Here's an example for you. So we have the full stack marketer, a lovely term coined from hacking marketing, also known as a gr growth hacker. And that person is the person that understands lots of different channels, lots of different technologies and brings them all together. We then have those that are emerging into FATTs. We have specialist roles like market automation specialists. We have data scientists. And then we might actually say, well, actually, if we're implementing a specific platform, I want a consultancy that specializes in that platform. So in a market automation platform, if I'm going to use Marketo, I want a Marketo specialist. And when you bring this together, you start to understand that it's not about an individual. and It's not about just going, I need a marketing technologist, or I need someone to run my marketing operations. It's much bigger than that. It ends up having to reassess your entire team where marketing exists. These are a bunch of functions that exist or different roles you could have in a MarTech team. Now, I, I'm non-committal about giving a specific framework for what a MarTech team should look like, because ultimately that depends on you. It depends on your company. It depends on how you match your roadmap to those individuals. But these are some example job titles that you might want to consider. Now, sometimes you'll have individuals that have multiple functions. Others, maybe you want to specialize in. And I have noticed I've got too many people on the pitch, by the way. That wasn't an accident. I just couldn't get rid of people. And there's even more roles than this. But my message here is that you need to rethink marketing departments. Technology is now at the heart. And operating as you used to won't work. In summary, we need to mix and match our skills and functions. But we need to think holistically about our teams. We need to think about different shapes of people. We need to think about those that you need to be specialists and those that you need to understand a hell of a lot about different areas. Right, so with our plans in place, with our people and teams, now we talk about technology, not sooner. Now we're going to talk about platforms, apps, and ecosystems. But the biggest mistake people have is they jump into this what too quickly. Before we start, we're not going to finish. There is no such thing as a perfect stack. It's an ongoing process. It's constantly developing. And this goes back to the importance of having people, because it's going to constantly evolve. So you need to make sure you've got the people that are on top of this and living it. So when we, when we talk about your stack, we go, first of all, go back and audit what you have. Keep it simple. So there's lots of ways in which you can frame your stack. There's a company in the US called Cabinet M, which are fantastic. They've got a book called Attack, Attack Your Stack, yeah, Attack Your Stack, which talk about different frameworks. This is a simplistic one we've created. And what we talk about is just literally overlaying your current solutions against the customer journey. But on top of that, we go back to the landscape. And we're going to make this available afterwards so you can literally play around with stickers and think about it in these terms. Because we try and make things simple here. At very top level, this is how you maybe would look at the different classifications of the market landscape. Or we could subcategorize it out. We can debate some of these. Maybe they appear in three areas, two areas, one at the top, one at the bottom. Sometimes you don't need everything. But it allows you to ask questions, not about, is it this blue logo or this orange logo or this purple one, but instead going, what do I need for this part of the customer's journey? You want to make this customer centric. You want to be solving a problem, not just getting pulled into the technology piece. So once you've laid this out, once you've understood, OK, these are the different types of technology that I would need in my stack you then start thinking about what you might have. These are just some examples. We're not in any way endorsing any of these. There's countless different versions you could have. But visualize what you have. Put it all into place. Understand what exists at the moment. And this could be an amazing exercise, because what you'll find is when you share this around your companies, more often than not, people won't even know this stack exists. Once you've laid that out, you need to ask yourself questions like, what's not working? Let's get rid. What's doing a great job? We're going to keep it. Where do we need to actually double down and improve on what we've got? Maybe we've got an amazing piece of kit, but we're not, just not capitalizing on it. Or where are we missing pieces of technology? Now, this is super important. I would say you will find, invariably, you will find technology you need to retire, and that will free up budget for you to reinvest. Equally, when we talk about invest, do it properly. 
I mean that. So many people go shopping, but they haven't done their business requirement gathering. They haven't defined what business goals, what problem is they solving. They haven't laid out an RFI, an RFP. They haven't really done the background. They haven't asked the end users of the product what they think. They've dived in and signed something off. And what happens? You sign off a shiny new piece of kit, and it gathers dust. It's more painful, it's slower, but it's doing it properly, and it's asking yourself the right questions about what is the point of this tech before you go and spend money. So once you have your stack in place, you then need to think about stacking it together. Sounds obvious, again. But people need to make sure they think holistically. Don't think about one solution in isolation. Think about how this fits with the rest of your stack. Now, I could nerd out on lots of different areas here, like talking about ecosystems and app, app sort of ecosystems you might want to focus on. The point is just step back. Don't dive into one solution. Think that this has got to work across the entire customer journey, and it's got to work with all the different pieces of kit you have. Therefore, you might find that part of your selection process fits more around what works and complements what you have in place versus what's exactly what you're after. Blend that out. Make sure you think about it properly. Make sure you're chatting internally. And make sure you understand the plumbing. Don't forget there's data underlying this that's got to push and pull around that. Make sure when that data is pushing and pulling that you really understand what exists, that you model this out properly, that you have the right architecture, that you're working with your technologists, your specialists in these areas. You don't need to understand every part of MarTech, but you do need to understand this at a top level. You need to be conversational, and you need to have this approach where you look at this in such a way that you're chatting across the entire team, and you're very clear about what it is you need to deliver. Again, these are the things that get lost. These are the things where people suddenly forget, oh my god, there's data. I've just gone and bought a shiny new piece of kit. I haven't thought about how it fits with everything else I have, and I haven't really considered how my data is going to flow seamlessly from one part to another. I think tech rarely fails. It's a failure to plan. It's a failure to map out and ask these types of questions that makes the real difference. Audit, map, and stack. Sounds really simple, but it's not. There's a hell of a lot that goes into this. Like I say, we could spend another half an hour nerding out in all these areas. This is just the top level for you to understand these foundations and ask the right question. Right, we're into our fourth P, our process and operations. This is bringing to life our plans. This is the part that differentiates us from capitalizing on the tech and the team we have in place. And again, it's another area that gets lost a lot of times. So when we say process and operations, what we really mean is that we're now in a MarTech-enabled world. We've invested heavily in our stack. We've invested in a fantastic team. We've got clear plans in place. We now need to bring that to life. And that means reimagining the market operations we've previously existed in. It means embracing change and a different operational approach. It means thinking about those nuts and bolts and being open to accepting and embracing new technology and new approaches to tech that didn't previously exist. To kick that off, we always recommend that you look at Agile. Agile's obvious, I say it's obvious. Technology has been using Agile methodologies for a very long time. Tech is now in marketing, why wouldn't you embrace it? It's that simple. Now, 50% of traditional marketers are now going to embrace it. And there's lots of different flavors of, of Agile. There's a whole multitude. But at its very core, the reason why it makes so much sense and why it makes so much sense now you're in a MarTech-enabled world is because it's about collaborating. It's about breaking things down. It's about moving. It's about being iterative. It's about great communication and collaboration. It's about understanding that traditional approaches of waterfall are too long-term thinking. The world's moving too quickly to not embrace Agile approaches. If you, wanna, if you wanna find out a hell of a lot more about Agile, I'd strongly recommend The Agile Marketer by Roland Smart, fantastic book, quite nerdy, so only if you really like Agile. Um, my next point around process and operational change is being data-informed. And I purposely use the word informed and not driven I think one of the dangers of being data-driven is we can sometimes forget people and being creative. So yes, we have loads more data available to us, and we should embrace that, and we should think differently. We should be in a PQL, SQL, CPA, CPL world. However, we shouldn't 
let that override everything. So we do want a science-driven approach. Now we've got all unbelievable measurability we never had before. It allows us to be more formulaic in our thinking. It allows us to think about the ingredients of what makes the right execution. And we can constantly optimize this. We can literally be like a DJ turning dials as they're executing and finding the right ingredients and constantly improving and optimizing. Which rolls into automation. Again, automation is not new. Everyone knows you need to do it. But you need to think about this very carefully. Before anything we, we talk about automation, my big thing is make sure you're still looking underneath the hood. People step back from this and they get carried away. They go, I've created my content. I've created my workflow. That's it. It's done. The leads will take care of themselves. It's not as simple as that. Now, automation can be amazing and beautiful and incredibly powerful, but stay close. Even with amazing technology and the power of AI and machine learning, you need to make sure you're asking questions. And the data and the insights you get are only going to be as good as what's come before this. So you need to also make sure you're still having the human involved and being creative and questioning different automation workflows and making sure you're grinding down that data from an analytical perspective. Now when we talk about analytics, there is so much data available to us, so much insight. Again, there can be a big problem with this. We can end up in a vanity metrics world. I would encourage you to try and have one dashboard. One dashboard that really means something. If you have two or three minutes in a day, what would you look at? What metrics would really mean something to you that you would do something different? I'm not suggesting that one dashboard forever. I think you build on that, but start with one. There's a lot of, a lot of people in data analytics that I chat with that create beautiful things, and, and I love data. It's one of the areas I nerd out on. But you could just end up with endless charts and prettiness, for, and so what? So get to the core and get the real, real, the real data points that mean something to you in place and have them circulated. Elevate this. Roll up your insight in such a way that it's accessible to your C-suite as well. You will need layers after that, but start with that main one first. Otherwise, you'll end up having meetings where you're talking about social media engagement versus ROI. It's not that social media engagement isn't critical, but start with understanding your ROI and attribution first. And then you've got operational alignment. With this whole multitude of different technologies, different channels now, there's so much happening that you need to align all of your plans. You need to be so organized, and you need to be able to mix and match these just so that you don't miss a beat. This is why you need a marketing operations person at the heart of your business that's really owning this and living and breathing those different dolls of execution for you. In summary, Agile, Data informs automation, analytics, ops. There's a lot there in process operations. Um, again, don't forget it. It's the execution. And when we talk about our four pieces of marketing technology, it's a perpetual cycle. It's not one and done. You're constantly learning, you're constantly improving from one P to the other. You're going to find that you're going to need more people. You're going to optimize your, your processes. You're going to need different platforms. Your plans are going to change year on year as new technology comes out and as, as, as internal business goals change. In summary, make sure you plan. Make sure you align your plans with your business objectives and the customer journey. Audit everything you do before you start looking at anything new. Visualize that roadmap of what you want to execute by understanding the core areas of opportunity. Don't forget about your people and teams. They're absolutely critical and they're so important. It's not easy to get this right. There isn't a perfect type of marketing technology function, but there are lots of different roles that you need to embrace. And you need to find different people that really understand this. You need to find people that love to learn, that will embrace change, and rethink how these people mix and match together. Think holistically about your team, about how they match up, and don't forget that actually, when you think about people and teams, you think about consultancies and agencies. Bring that all together. Platforms, apps, and ecosystems. Don't just go shopping. And don't skip the first two Ps before you get here. When you are here, visualize it against the customer, customer journey. Make sure you understand what you have in place before you go anywhere near spending cash. 
Don't be afraid to retire te technology people aren't using. Understand why people aren't using it. Map it all out. Understand that when you do go shopping, you need to do it properly. You need to understand your business goals, your core requirements, and do it methodically. And then you're into your process and operations. Commit to changing your, how marketing operates when you're in a MarTech-enabled world. I've only got, got five minutes left. I, I couldn't talk about everything that's in our four Ps, but you could go to our site and you could find out a little bit more. Um, also, I'm here all day, so more than happy to chat at length in any of these areas. I appreciate this is intended to give you a very top level. If you want to go a lot deeper, a lot more technical, I'm more than happy to chat with you more. And if you want to find out more from me, drop me an email, tweet me, add me on LinkedIn. Um, and then just a side point, uh, I love books. If anyone else here loves marketing books, I'm a big nerd. Uh, so I run a marketing technology book club, which is super fun, and I'd strongly recommend you sign up for that as well. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.